Well, again, uh, es essentially, essentially what you've described, if I was dealing with that kind of solution, more likely I'd go to a web-based approach. If I have an application that's running on the web, all right, running out in the cloud that I want to access, like Google Docs, I guess Google Docs would be a great example, right? Google Docs, we're all familiar with that, right? It's word processing, whatever. Actually, they have both solutions, right? I can write, or I can download an Android application for Google Docs on my phone, <coughs> and I can go and access my Google Docs and do everything I want to with that. I could also, through my mobile browser, go to Google Docs and, and do that. So the application of Google Docs, which is running out on the web, all right, um, allows two different front ends. And again, as I mentioned, one sort of, one thing we'll sort of find in conclusion is, for any number of reasons, a lot of organizations don't choose between these, but rather do both of these. What's something else that's different from an app versus um, a mobile website? Maybe think about it from a non-technical perspective and more from a user perspective. How about an application is more readily, more readily available to a person than the mobile website? Yeah, applications are usually like really focused and directed yeah. to some activity. All right. In other words, if I wanted to see what the weather is, I'd have a couple of choices on my device, right? I could open up my mobile web browser, type in weather.com, or if I had it bookmarked, go and, and find that bookmark, and boom, it will go and pull up that page. And it would be their mobile website, which would have a lot of stuff. It might have warnings about a hurricane, or it might be geared towards my location, but it might have other news as well, and so on and so forth. Compare that to, to weather.com's web app. Or, I'm sorry, not web app, but um, Android app or iPhone app. There you press a button, it shows you your weather. It says it's 79 degrees out, there's a 65% chance of rain tonight, and, and so on. It's very directed, whereas a mobile website is sort of open-ended. You can get out there, you can explore, you can find different things about it. Typically, mobile apps are written very directed towards some real specific purpose. And to a large degree, that's what a lot of the end users want, all right? You know, for some people, the web and the promise to be able to go out on the web and do anything you want is like, great. You mean I can go to weather.com and find what the weather's going to be in Montreal next week? That's wonderful. I can do all these things and do this, that, and the other. A lot of technical people love that sort of stuff, all right? But your average Joe, a lot of times, he just want to know, is it, what, should I take a jacket to work, right? Is it going to rain tonight? They are very focused on what they want to do. And I think that's the one thing that apps have provided is the web is massive, flexible. It's the Wild West out there. It's, it's anything you can do, imagine you can go and do. Apps are typically very focused towards one piece of functionality. Yes? You guys know the way to say Apps, in a way, eliminate thinking. They're very direct, and, and you, you simply press a button, and you get to do what you want to do. All right? Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of organizations hedge their bets, right? Certainly not going to, no organization certainly not, uh, is certainly not going to want to, say, exclude Android devices from their plans or exclude iPhone, right? You're going to want to do both of them, more than likely, all right? The usage is, is high enough where you'd want to do both of them. But in addition to that, you may also want to consider uh, a mobile website, all right? And there's definitely advantages to doing uh, the mobile website as well, all right? You know, to extend the weather.com example, yeah, it's great to have a button to press on and get my weather very easily. But if I truly wanted a flexible 
experience where I was planning a vacation. I was taking a trip cross country and I wanted to see what the weather was going to be. It'd be nice to have nice access on my mobile device, all right, to do some of the unusual things that maybe I wouldn't do. Plus there's the unsupported devices, you know, things such as, you know, Windows phone that doesn't fall into that category or, or Blackberries or, or old fashioned phones, all right. So the bottom line is that both of these are typically a part of an organization strategy. All right? You want to have your website such that it can be accessed by mobile devices without any problem. <coughs> but if there is something specific to uh, some specific functionality, really targeted functionality, you know, you would want <coughs> to have um, um, an app. A real good example of it, in my mind, is the difference between Amazon's app and website. Um, Amazon's app, again, allows you to do certain things, but there are some times that you'd want to go to the full site to get maybe more detail about something. All right? I think it's Amazon. I might be getting confused between, uh, with another one. All right. So... Apps and mobile websites. For the most part, we're not going to talk tons more about apps. We will talk about later on uh, a bit about apps. So let's focus on mobile websites. Because this is where we're going to spend most of our time. To create mobile websites, in general, there's two strategies that you can take. Now, one thing to keep in mind is these aren't like two mutually exclusive strategies. It's not like you do one or the other. There's a lot of crossover and blending and hybrids and all these sorts of things. So don't think when I define these that you're going to do this, you're going to do that. One thing about this class is in this class we study a whole bunch of different techniques relating to mobile websites and mobile design. All right? These techniques, you mix and match together to come up with the best solution for the problem that you're facing. So it's not a case of, like, you're going to take this strategy, you're going to take that strategy. You're going to take what you like from one strategy and what you like from another and sort of piece it together to come up with a solution. All right, so I'm going to define these as though they're like separate paths, but they're really not because there's a lot of mixing and matching. These are just some sort of general strategies that and approaches that you can use. All right. General, generally speaking, you can either have a responsive site separate sites for mobile and desktop environments. Now the reason why I say that you have mix and match is some of the same techniques you use in responsive sites you're also going to use even if you do have separate sites. All right, So that's why it's not like a mutually exclusive thing here. But for you, sort of your first decision to make is, in general, you're going to have one site that's responsive, or are we going to have separate sites? What do you think I mean by responsive? What, what does that word mean in this context? It discovers what the what device is using it and which apps. Okay. Um, one aspect of it is as aware of the device. You can actually do some neat responsive things, even if it isn't aware of the specific device, but a good part of, of responsive, um, some of the more, more um, you know, involved techniques requires actually knowing what that device is and 
changing the page accordingly based on the kind of device. How about a response to the screen size? Does he usually have to know what right. the device is? It's just the, what, what is, how is it being displayed? Okay. So the, the other statement was that we can write something specific to the device. Sometimes we don't care about the specific advice, but we're just interested in the size of the screen. All right? In general <coughs> terms, when we describe a site as responsive, it means that the, the page itself, the page layout, the page appearance, and possibly even the page content, adapts itself depending on the environment the page is being viewed on. Which means that you will have a page that you, you can look at the exact same URL, you type in a URL, and it will look one way if you view it on a phone, it will look a different way if you view it on a desktop device. It may look different on a tablet than it looks on either a phone or a desktop device. That's what we mean by responsive, is that the page in some manner or another adapts itself to its environment on, on how it's being displayed. Now, generally speaking, this can be done two different ways. This can either be done by HTML and CSS. I mean, if you've taken the CISS 216 class, all right, you'll see that even something so simple as making the widths of your text or, or widths of your, your divs or whatever a percentage of the page makes it responsive, right? By my definition, responsive. The page looks different depending on the size of the browser window. So it responds, it adapts itself to how it's being displayed. And that's one real tiny thing that you can do without even getting into any sort of crazy stuff that's just very basic. A mix of HTML and CSS. All right? The other way that this can be accomplished is via some form of scripting. And that can either be JavaScript scripting or it can be server-side scripting. Now, this is one aspect of the class that's a little, that can be a little bit difficult when we get into the scripting. Because depending on your background, you may or may not have done any sort of server-side scripting before. My aim here is to keep that part real simple. So we're not going to do the most involved things, but we're going to do some very basic scripting. All right? And I'll walk you through a lot of what you need to know, and you can certainly ask questions, and so on. So this is one area that I think I go into a lot more depth than the book does. The book, I think, kind of glosses over a lot of the scripting, but we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about the scripting and how to do it. But I'm here to coach you with that if you haven't, don't have a lot of experience in it. All right? That's having one responsive site. There are things that we can do, just some basic things that we can do in HTML, CSS, that can accomplish that. And there are things that we can do in server-side scripting to make our page responsive. Have any of you ever gone to a site, for example, and, you know, to download some software, and it magically knew that you were on a Mac, let's say, so you download the Mac version of the software, or it magically knew that you were on a Windows machine and do that. That would be the kind of responsiveness that would be accomplished via scripting. That's not something that you could easily do um, simply via HTML and CSS. A lot of what you can do with HTML and CSS relates to the size of the screen, which is certainly a big factor. All right, certainly a big factor. But some more advanced features like that, showing the map versus that, Having a link to the um, 
Apple Store versus the Android Store, depending on the kind of device that you're on for your app, would be an example of that. Excuse me. Yes. So if if I understand server side side scripting in depth, I really can eliminate everything else. No. All right. Well, I mean, I need HTML and CSS. Right. <clears throat> That would simplify everything. That would boil it down to its essence. So I could have a site that covers all my mobile web apps, or all my mobile websites, and all my desktop websites. No. Okay. Uh, again, uh, keep in mind these are all these are all tools that you'll have. Uh, one tool doesn't supersede the others. All right. Um, First of all, keep in mind that at this point, we're not even talking about two, two sites. We're talking about one site, one page that itself is responsive. We're not talking about two pages, whereas you get directed to one or the other. That's what we're going to talk about in a minute here. All right. So right now, we're only talking about one page. And again, um, in some cases, there are, there are alternatives of what you can do via JavaScript versus server-side coding. All right. Um, so you, you you could say yeah if I can if I know how to do it the server side I don't really need to worry about JavaScript, but there's some things you can do via JavaScript that you can't do via server side scripting. For example, geolocation. All right, the web server don't know where you are. The web server approximately knows where you are. All right, who does know where you are? The device that you're running knows where you are. The device has the GPS sensor or whatever. And it can tell exactly where you are. Uh, the server doesn't have access to that. So therefore, if you wanted to do really good geolocation, you would need to use something that was client-side to do it. So you'd need to use JavaScript. So again, none of these tools supersede the other. These are all tools in your, in your tool chest that you, you pull out and use as you need them. Second option is to have a separate site for mobile and desktop. So we're going to have two sets of pages. All right. Now, again, the reason why these aren't really mutually exclusive is these two separate sites were also likely going to build using responsive techniques. You know, there's a huge difference for example, between phones, right? You got some of them giant phones and you got some of the tiny phones, right? So to say that I'm going to have a mobile site versus a desktop site, that might not really be adequate. That might not do everything that we'd want it to do. Likewise, there's a big difference between different monitor sizes that people have, even on a desktop machine. So gee, wouldn't it be great to take advantage of the people that have the gigantic monitors and, and give them more stuff and to... Uh, have it laid out perhaps differently for someone that has a window that is narrower. So we're going to apply these responsive techniques, the same techniques we're applying here, we're going to apply that here. Now, what would be the possible rationale for having a mobile site, a separate mobile site and desktop site? Why would I do that? If I could create a site, if I could create one responsive site that handles both of it, it seems to be a lot extra work to develop two sites. What's the rationale between having two sites? Yes? What they'd be used for. Okay. If you had specific things that you were going to let them do on their phone or mobile device versus full access to everything. Okay. That's an excellent point. In fact, I want to rewind a second and let's talk about how someone is likely to access the web differently on a mobile device versus a desktop device. What are the differences between accessing a website on a computer versus a mobile device? Yeah, how do we do? First thing would be things that relate to the device itself. Input methods. You don't move a mouse 
to click on something, you touch it. That already gives you maybe a difference in how you're going to set up your links, right? You know, with my fingers, sometimes I'm pressing six links at the same time when I go to press it if it's not designed correctly. Whereas with the mouse, I could fine tune and navigate and, and do it in there, all right? Generally speaking, um, although there are people that are a lot better at it than I am, it is harder to type on a mobile device than it would on a conventional keyboard. All right. What's another aspect of the device besides the input method? How about you can like, take advantage of, like, like you said, like GPS and like the accelerometer okay. and uh, All right. things of that nature? Mobile devices. have extra stuff that a computer doesn't. And it, it, that, that's, that's a good insight to, to, to realize that. Because usually what happens when there's any new technology is you try to duplicate an old technology on a new platform. You know, I, I probably talked about this in the 216 class, right? When TV first came out, a lot of them were simply TV versions of old radio shows, right? And same sort of thing. You know, when movies first came out, they were just filmed plays. And then it took a while to sort of work through and figure out what's distinct about the medium that, that you can really take advantage of those benefits. Well, I think in the past, historically, mobile sites were viewed as regular websites on a smaller screen. <laughs> all right, and that's all people viewed it as. All right, and that's fine. That's sort of the first phase of the evolution of a technology of taking an old technology, that is, web pages on a computer, and apply it to a different medium, now on a mobile device. But in reality, all right, there's some things. Mobile devices aren't simply small computer screens. Most mobile devices, or, or let me say, many mobile devices, have a phone connected to it. Right. So in other words, instead of having text that says, call 1-800-NEED-HELP for support, you can actually have a button that you press that dials that phone number, right? Making it so much easier for the user, all right? Instead of relying on something such as your IP address to determine where you're located, mobile devices have GPS information, all right? that you can find out exactly where someone is located. So if you're doing anything that is uh, location sensitive, depending on the nature of it, mobile devices can give superior, far superior location information than a desktop would. So it's important as we're going forward to not just think of, well, I'm going to have a scaled down version of my website for a mobile site, but to think of, um, are there some things about the mobile environment that I can incorporate features for that I couldn't do in a desktop environment? Yes? So would it be the overall user goal? Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to check to see if you have you know, broken into my office and stolen any of my notes because that's always something that I always talk about is user goals. Right. Not really, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. People that access mobile sites typically have different goals than people accessing uh, the site via the computer. And I think there's no better example of that, and, and if you think of accessing, and again, I'm not really <coughs> sure. I, well, I kind of know what our, our website looks like LC's website looks on a mobile device, but let's imagine an ideal college, all right, an ideal college website. <laughs> that, that sounded a lot snarkier than I intended it to, all right, I really didn't intend it to be sarcastic like that. Let's imagine a, a perfect world and a perfect college. How is there, mo what are some things that you might do on a mobile website for that perfect college? What are some things that you might do on a desktop? version of that college's site. Well, yes? I think on, a, on, the, on the desktop version, you would allow maybe a user to access like their My Campus and like register for classes, even look up classes. 
Okay. Um, it might be a little bit harder to do on a mobile device to actually sit down and register for class. Okay. Why? Because of input method and right. You have to type out forms in your right. information. Right. All right. Um, which one would you expect people to spend tasks that take a longer time on? The desktop. The desktop, right? So in other words, if you were interested in computers, let's say, and you know you were coming in and you wanted to come to our perfect college and you were interested in computers, but you really didn't know what direction you wanted to take, you know, maybe you want to study networking, maybe you want to study software design or, or web design or whatever. That sort of activity of sitting down and looking at the different courses and and reading up about those careers and about those fields and maybe looking at some of the course descriptions and maybe registering and, uh, for your classes probably is something that you're going to be sitting down at a desktop machine or a laptop to do. All right? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Just contacting people. It'd be your mobile device, you'd want to contact your professor. Okay. Or email your professor, check your grades. Or okay. Just well, well let's, let's go to that part of the question. Sure. What, what are some things that you would likely want to do uh, on a mobile device? So <coughs> contacting people. In other words, what would be an example of that? Uh, of a reason why you'd want to contact someone? I'm not going to be in class today. Not going to be in class today, right? So it would be nice if you could, you know, easily go access the, the college directory It'd be really great if, if you showed you your schedule and you could pick that, but even if you couldn't, if you could access the college directory and find your professor and call them, all right, that would, that would be pretty good. Or, or shoot an email, call campus security, all right, if there was someone walking around the parking lot that looked suspicious, that would be something that you'd want to do. You know, look, looks like someone's breaking into that car. I think I'll run to a lab and sit down at the desktop machine and fire up the brain. No, you would, you would want to be able to, with the mobile device, just very easily go and do that. What's something else that you might want to do via your mobile device that um, um, might become more relevant the later months of the semester? How about getting like weather alerts? And yeah, checking for snow days and stuff, you know, right? If you are, for example, if you're coming from your job, you know, and, and you wanted to see, um, you know, if it's snowing and it looked bad and you were curious, you want to go and not necessarily have access to a, a desktop machine, but just bring it up on the phone and instantly see right off the top of the bat. Is there a weather alert or is there not a weather alert? So. The point is, is that besides differences in the device, and I think the one difference of the device is so obvious that we forgot to mention it, the screen size. <coughs> the goals of the user is different, are different in a mobile environment. They often are different in a mobile device, uh, environment. So. When we look at these two things, truth be told, you know, we could always, uh, I'm hesitant to say the word always because that, that's a big word. Pretty much no matter our situation, we could probably take each of these two paths. All right? And we could develop one super page that was really responsive. Or we could break it down and develop two simpler pages, one dedicated to mobile, one dedicated to desktop. The question then becomes, you know, what is it easier to do? To have one really complicated page or to have two relatively simple pages? And I guess that depends on the nature of the organization, the nature of the differences in the user goals, and so on. Let me give you a for instance of, of two cases that I would think um, one might, in one case I might be pushed in one direction, and in the other case I might be pushed in another direction. If I was a restaurant, all right, I might lean towards having simply one responsive site. Why? Think about the kinds of things that you do when you visit a, a restaurant's website. Are the kinds of things that you would do on a restaurant's website, drastically different if you were at home 